Hey everyone, welcome back to the Coalition for Marriage YouTube channel. We're in the midst of giving you three compilation videos over the Christmas and early January period. Compilation videos of the many, many guests we've had over the last year. Uh, one of our videos has looked at the education system, what's going on, what kids are being taught, and encouraging us really as parents to get involved with that and really to, to stop the rate of decay. Another one has looked at those who have lost their positions because of standing up for man-woman marriage, but have been vindicated. Uh, and this video today is looking at advice that we've had from the many people we've spoken to, uh, ranging from policy advice to governments, right the way down to very practical day-to-day -day advice for you and me as individuals on how we can promote and encourage man-woman marriage in our society and back to its rightful place within our culture. So thank you for watching over the last year or so. Thank you very much for your encouragement. Please forward this to your friends and your family. Get them to get involved with the C4M going across to c4m.org.uk and clicking that join button. But for now, let's enjoy the clips together. What do you think we can do to, to help these people? Yeah, I, I guess very often it's about, you know, looking at, you're sort of distilling out the principles of what is it that's good about marriage and then explaining that in ways that don't turn people off, you know, to talk about actually stability is good. Commitment is good. You know, having someone who's got your back is good and and certainly being able to bring children up in a stable environment is really good so what can we do to promote that what can we do at every turn especially where there are difficulties how can we do that you know for for people in prison how can we promote access to their family so that their kids can still see them so that they're less likely to have family breakdown how can we do the criminal justice system so that you know, you don't instantly lose your counsel flat when you get sent on a short sentence into prison, but actually there's some way of trying to promote and engender that stability so that when you come out the other end, you're not back to square one. What Are there ways that we can do what we call liaison and diversion so that people don't instantly get put into prison for certain things, but there are other ways that the criminal justice system can um it can work on them and, and i suppose for for those in leadership responsibility you know for politicians for for healthcare commissioners for those um in the uh, civil service i think we need to be able to to be a little braver to say actually you know marriage stability commitment these are good things we should be able to um promote them without you know being told that we're stigmatizing someone who's in a different situation we want to yeah. be able to support people yeah. And, and yes, recognize that there are alternative lifestyles and alternative worldviews, but not to then say we've just got to pretend everything's the same and all the outcomes are the same. And I think, you know, th thinking, you know, certainly for us as Christians or whatever um, worldview someone comes from to say, okay, how can we articulate the, the roots of what we believe in a way that others can understand? So I, I've certainly found that uh, very helpful in terms of, the work that, that I do in, in my prison work, but also in, in my work through CMF, you know, whenever we're looking at ethical issues at the end of life, the beginning of life, in other issues like gender and sexuality, we need to be able to pare it down and think, what is the basics of what we're talking about here, and not necessarily dress it up in Christian language, even though that might be the root of it. I think the biggest thing that we can do kind of getting practical with it is to say to be aware of the way that technology is shaping and forming us to slow down in a society that wants us to go faster, faster, faster and pursue convenience above all things and efficiency above all things to slow down and ask some of the hard questions of not only what technology is, how is it forming and shaping us? And in what particular ways may we be um, com uh, kind of weak or uh, maybe we have some areas that we need to strengthen in terms of how we go about not only cultivating personal virtue, family virtue, and kind of social virtue, and then having the conversations. Much of this work that I recently published called The Digital Public Square, entitled Christian Ethics in a Technological Society, is asking some of these high-level questions from pornography to hate speech to free expression or religious freedom, navigating a lot of these questions from a particularly a Christian perspective, ethical perspective.
perspective, but to say, no, these are actually representing much larger conversations that are happening yeah. in our society, whether you're a person yeah. of faith or not. These are important and all of us need to step into those conversations and be active because yeah. we yeah. can't keep technology kind of at arm's length as we often yeah. have for so many years to realize the enormous role that the technology industry has and these tools have in shaping our perspective of the world. In many ways, having the, the British courts determine the proper scope of freedom of conscience, freedom of, of religion and so on, uh, uh, you know, that, 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 that may be something that um, you, would, you would prefer not to have, at least relative to the current Strasbourg court, which is made up of a pretty broad spectrum of perspectives on these questions, because the European Convention has, I think, 47 signatories, including judges with views that are probably, you know, not 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 quite on the progressive bandwagon. So it's not clear to me at all that the British Bill of Rights would is 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 really going to, is going to fix much. And indeed, a lot of these questions are pre-political and and are far 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 upstream of any policy levers or, or, or legislative levers um though law is a teacher and 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 the, the the message that a society sends for example when it introduces and uh, recognizes same-sex marriage is has has very important downstream uh, ramifications you know the certainly the re religiously motivated arguments are are now out of the question when it comes to these questions of uh, questions of marriage and family and so on even if they're sort of hovering in the background i think they're generally speaking not helpful in in a broadly secular public square uh, i think the better way to make the argument is to show the extent to which flourishing intact families contribute to the good of to the good of all and then i think the the, the, the task is one for uh, debating in the public square by appealing to and marshalling evidence in favor of the benefits that intact family formation uh, family for successful family formation intact families bring yep. To, yep. to the common good and so th and that then to start looking at ways in which we can introduce policies that benefit everybody um and that means by the way not nationalizing childcare in my view yeah. means yeah you know, yeah Taking Which we're doing more and more of, aren't we, really? I know that a lot of the Conservative Party was not on board with that. But, you know, the idea that we should be incentivizing mothers and fathers to release their children, put their children into childcare at earlier and earlier ages, it, rather than, say, um, change, making tweaks to the tax system that make it easier for one of the parents to spend longer at home with, with the child, whether that's extend, extending maternity leave or leave or extending paternity leave or taxing households rather than individuals um uh, the the you know the tax penalty really or the or the the absence of any meaningful tax 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 uh, tax benefits playing a role in family uh, successful flourishing of families mm. is, is is nothing short of a scandal for a conservative government and so you know just sim relatively simple tweaks, uh, for example, uh, making personal allowances to be to be you know, transferable between yeah. spouses. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, that's a way of recognising marriage. Um, I mean, Cameron talked a lot about it. Um, the coalition government talked a lot about it, but did very very little. Uh, I mean, Cameron was, was was you know his argument for introducing same sex legal recognition of same sex marriage was that it was a, it was a conservative. A conservative approach and the reason for that is that he thought that supporting marriage was a conservative position but he didn't then deliver on his stated commitment that or his stated belief that the marriage supporting marriage, of marriage yes. in society in any other way and i think what you guys do is really important we need to provide the evidence about marriage what i would say is you're getting a lot of this critique of the culture coming from non-christians so uh, gay atheists like douglas murray is pretty mm. perceptive no, my view is what yeah. we should do is we should learn to understand our culture and then we should apply the hope of the gospel. So there's a danger you can mm. be all doom and mm. gloom. You can say this is terrible. We're going. My, mm. here's, here's where I'm going. I'm saying we are regressing to a Greco-Roman pagan view of the world, but it was in that world that the gospel first flourished. Mm. So yeah. we have to, without retreating into some, you know, some kind of Christian, sub-Christian um, culture. I think the, the the key areas for me is we need Christian education. So we do need Christian schools. Um, you, we, 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 that, that, I personally think we should have a Christian university in the United Kingdom. 
I think we need Christian politicians to stop playing the game and just to speak up and, you know, learn from Kate Forbes and Tim Farron and others. Yeah. And uh, yeah. to be fair, Jacob Rees-Mogg, I mean, when, when yeah. he gave that answer from abortion on ITV in that interview, it was just Yeah, yeah. it's very, very good. Yeah, very good. Yeah. yeah. And I, I, I think that um, I think we need to be very careful not to equate Christianity with a particular political viewpoint as yeah. well, because then you'll just get written off as being usually right wing. But, but what I would say is mm, politics is not our solution. But I would mm. say the big thing for Christians is we have to model in our own churches, in our own communities and in our own marriages what it's like. Absolutely. And then we yeah. can go and say yeah. to people, listen. Yeah. My marriage is not perfect, but it's possible to yeah. have a marriage according to God's standards Great. and f families in that way. And then we care, you know, for the widows, for the orphans, for single moms, single dads, all that kind of mm. stuff. You know, mm. I, I, I would argue this. We, we, we show love and care for homosexual people. I, as I said, I had homosexual people and uh, I had a transgender person in my congregation over 30 years ago. Well, the church is there for sinners. Let's make that quite clear. Yeah. You know, so yeah. everyone and, and all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. In 2014, the UN uh, brought in a resolution that the, fam the family should be the unit of, um, of economic consideration. They should at least have the option of being taxed as a unit. Um, because I think a lot of the problems um, arise because they're seen as individuals. But the benefit system was set up, the tax credit system was set up to help families because the tax system didn't do it. But the problem with the benefit system is that as soon as you go onto it, it's very hard to come off it. And now the government are introducing more and more sanctions so that you you really, once you start accepting benefits, you are under the sort of diktat of the state. So now they're introducing sanctions that if you don't, Start looking for work when your child is one that you will be you know sanctioned and maybe lose your benefits so i really think the family needs to be um i they need to be taxed as, as a unit and and freer to use the money as they as they choose one of the first things is to write to your mp and say um you know we would like the option to be able to care for our own children um, and one uh, one big thing that we're trying to push for is um, to make child benefit fair, because a lot of a lot of families now are because the fresh thresholds been frozen for so long um, are, are hitting this point of fifty thousand where they start losing their or well, married tax allowance if they have it. Uh, they start hitting the higher rate tax. They start losing their child benefit, and they really are not very rich families. It depends where you're living. You know, if you're living in London. Where you're paying sort of two thousand pounds a month rent fifty thousand is not a huge income um and um the other problem with that is you know when you start losing your child benefit you hit the high rate tax it's very difficult to earn more money to bring home more disposable income so for yep. every pound you earn as a as a primary as a breadwinner <laughs> whether that's mother or father you lose about 70p of that depending how many children you have you can lose up to 90 or even it may even not be yep. worth getting a pay rise because you lose more money than you earn yeah. so um with the taxation it really needs to be fair for families so they can actually earn more and bring home money rather than you know meet these cliff edges and meet these really high marginal tax rates mm -hmm. uh, and, and these occur right the way up the income stream and, and particularly on when you're on universal credit you face really high marginal rates of tax so mm -hmm. they're almost not worth earning more so we need to change that so that families can can earn more and bring more home. The, the, the beauty of doing that is it does place the employer in a position where they have to then make a decision. You put pressure on them, are they going to go to tribunal or they're going to offer to settle out of court? So this is the importance of making the challenge in the first place. Because you don't make the challenge, they're not put in a position where they have to make a decision. And I think this is the, the key to, um, you know, if anyone else is out there who's having challenges um, with an employer in whatever capacity and they're being persecuted for their beliefs, particularly their traditional beliefs, it's so important that you, you challenge, you, you actually um, ask them to explain themselves, put them in a position where they have to um, kind of uh, make their case, if you like, and not just walk away, because walking away doesn't achieve anything. It, it's a lose. It's a lose for the person that's being persecuted. It's a lose, losing situation. You need to challenge those who are, um, you know, persecuting you basically, and force them into a place where they have to make a decision. So that 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 that, that was the idea, and it actually worked quite well. It's a challenge. I do appreciate that, and um, 
you know, it's honourable to provide for your family, but it's a personal decision. Yeah. Because ultimately, God is our source. You know, our job isn't our source. God may have given no. you the job, but He can easily give you another one too. Yeah. So um, we, we really have to examine. It's a personal choice. You have to look inside. I can't provide a blanket solution answer no, for everyone, no. but it's a personal choice. You have to look inside. Who no, am I? No. Well, settle it ahead of time. So no, if the no. moment comes, you know exactly what to do. If people read only chapter 22 of the book, it's the, the just brilliant and inspiring story of Hungarian parents who fought back against a communist regime who had totally taken over their education system. And thankfully, you're not there yet. We're on our way. So you're absolutely right. People often say, well, what can we do? There's a, there's a whole lot we can do. But the most important thing we can do is teach our children in our homes. Teach them washing away all the bad things that are that they've taught in society and at school and through their phones and whatever. We need to teach the truth sanely, calmly, lovingly, powerfully at home. And t starting with what we believe ab about the family, gender, sex, marriage, you know, uh, our own religious beliefs, what, what we believe about freedom, you know, all, all these things we need to be engaged in talking to about our ch to our children about those things. And there's no shortage of opportunities to do that with everything that's coming out in society. We're, we're presented daily with opportunities to talk through these things, and we must do it. And the thing is, our children, for the most part, although they won't always make all the choices we want, they will listen to us. And this battle really will be fought at home. It's ironic. The, the, the battle is against the family, but it's by the family that this battle will, will be won. I think it mm. will be one family at a time. Mm. Of course, mm. we need to take public action. Of course, we need to influence our schools and legislation. But if we're not teaching at home, how much are all those thing, other things going to matter? Yeah. I think how we live is, is actually really important here. My wife and I celebrated our 29th anniversary recently. And, oh, congratulations. Uh, oh, thank you. Yeah. Um, it, it's been the best decision of my life to, to marry Debbie, by far the best decision of my life, um, because of what it does for my life, the enhancement, the enrichment. And to be married for that length of time to somebody, uh, I, I had a young person saying to me, do you ever get to a point where, where it becomes boring? Well, well, not really, because when you're committed to your own marriage and you work at it, and every relationship needs to be worked at, when you do work at it, it, it gets better and better. It's get, it gets more uh, 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 more rich, uh, more enjoyable, uh, more, more stable. And I think what Christians can do is, in their own lives, commit to their own marriages, really work hard at that, because... Uh, what we say from the platform, for example, when, when we're preaching, has to be backed up by the way we live our lives. So, so commit to your own uh, marriage. Make sure that that's something that you you really work hard at, so that people can see from the outside this is which is good. It works. It brings joy, and. Um, it can bring stability to life. He's done a very good job, Harry Miller, of making sure, carving out, certainly, that the police can't interfere with you uh, in, in a way that would be actually very disadvantageous to you on a yep. civil level. Yep. Um, and that's the kind of thing, that's the kind of organisation that can also support those who really want to speak out. Yeah. Um, yeah. I think mainly it's you, you don't necessarily need to be overtly uh, brash about, you know, the opinions mm. that you have. I think mm. often what you can do is simply, in a very calm and quiet and considered way, engage in ordinary civic life and make sure that you organise with other people of, of like mind mm. to make sure that some of the bad proposals that are there, some of the bad mm. ideas that are mm. there, are discouraged and simply defeated. Um, so that's why I say I encourage people to become governors and also local politicians and all sorts yep. of other areas, wherever you feel you can contribute as an individual. That's right. And that'll be yeah. different from each individual. You know, everyone is different. Everyone has their skill sets. Everyone has something to contribute. Um, and I would simply say, find out how you can contribute in the best possible way and then contribute as best you can. If you do run into someone trying to cancel you, quote unquote, then people like uh, Harry Miller and Faircop are there to help you in that regard. And of course, people like us, FBT, are there to help inform you. Um, but I'd also encourage people to, where they do see bad examples, where they see uh, examples of where there is bad RSH, for example, or where someone is engaging in a way that would be harmful um, when it comes to gender ideology or, ideology or sex education or any of these things. Please do tell us. Please do in, uh, come to FET and, and let us know that kind of thing, because it's actually in having those individual anecdotes and then seeing the patterns of those anecdotes across 
um, across society that we're able to do our own research and identify what would be actually uh, the best kind of research to engage in and actually point this out and bring it to public knowledge so that there can be a better informed public debate. That's what we're really all about. And we can only do that if people tell us what's going on. So please do get in touch and inform us because it's really hugely helpful. So how do we do policies that help people achieve the things they want to achieve? So first of all, item one, build, baby, build. Okay, the biggest cost for families is housing. Um, you got to have houses. You need houses for people. The big barrier to houses is all the these you know zoning and land use rules that make it impossible to build. You need to strip away all the zoning and land use rules. You need to be able to build and build and build. Make housing cheap. Housing should be a crappy investment. Okay, like I want housing prices to fall so that all the homeowners are really sad about their housing investment. <laughs> like, and I know that everybody's like, that's, that's horrible. Yeah. But you know what? Yeah. Here's the reality. Long run, if population is growing, house prices are not actually going to fall. Mm. Okay, there's just not. What we're really saying is we want house, pl- house prices to, be dis- to have a, a normal and disciplined ratio to income. Right now, they don't pay parents. Um, The reality is parents make an enormous sacrifice. They give up huge amounts of income, sleep, time, health. They retire with less money in the bank. And then they also get less from their pensions because pensions relate to income and all these things. Um, uh, Parents shoulder an enormous load for who? For society. We should pay them for it. There are different ways you can do this. Many countries have caretaker credits in their public pensions, where if you take time off work with a small child at home, you get like a a credit in your pension. We can expand those, make them bigger. The U.S. doesn't have one. I don't know if I don't know if the UK does. If you don't, Uh, if your country, I I don't think it does. No. So yeah. So you can you can implement them, but many many countries have these. This is not like some wild eyed right wing conspiracy. A caretaker credit in retirement programs is a very reasonable thing. You can make it big. You can make it generous, and also it shouldn't only be if you leave work. Like if you have legal custody of a child, you should get some kind of caretaker credit. And if you do leave work to take care of them, you should get even more. So that's that's uh, pay parents in their retirement. Second, pay parents today. Um, parents are doing work today. You know, if you have a public child care program, you recognize that those child care workers are doing work. Is the parent at home doing worse work? Like, is, is their work less socially valuable? No. Um, just because, like, like, if a parent goes and starts flipping burgers at a... I don't know. That's my American analogy. What's the British one? Like, oh, you know, we have burgers here. Fry, frying yeah, chips yeah. at a fast food place or something. <laughs> All um, right, matey. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, and they get paid minimum wage. Yeah. Uh, and then they put their kid in childcare. And the total cost of enrolling that child in childcare is also minimum wage. Did that mm. benefit society? Mm. Like, no, it didn't. Um, probably the parent with the child would have given more loving and beneficial care. Finland, many countries, Finland is a good example, provide homemaker allowances for families that don't have their kids in childcare. This is totally reasonable. Lots of countries do this. It's again, it's not some vast right wing conspiracy. Finland is not like like a crazy right wing place. It okay? certainly isn't. <laughs> You're quite um, right. We're talking about like 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 social democratic paradise here. Um, a homemaker allowance is totally reasonable. And again, you can pair it with public child care and centers as well. You know, I'm saying just give people a choice, a fair choice, where they, where they are treated fairly on both sides. So would, um, you, would, you, would you means test that or would it be available to everyone? Oh, no, 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 no. You, none of this should be means tested. Okay. This is about your job as a parent, not that you're poor. Right. Your job as a parent doesn't matter if you're rich or poor. Yep. Okay. So I would say you need to make the benefit big enough that middle class people think it's valuable, which means for poor people, it's going to be a lot of money. Oh, marriage penalties. Sorry. Yeah, really, item two should be marriage penalties Um, is look for marriage penalties in your current law and get rid of them. Okay. Okay. Balance out. Yeah, that's massive, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, that's, that's a huge one. Um, but like, look for marriage penalties and get rid of them. You're absolutely correct. 
um, fiscal incentives have actually worked demonstrably. I, I mentioned earlier on that my wife is at, not at, the, at the court today, is on the bench in the magistrate's court. Now, every one of those young boys, and they're 15, 16, 17 year old boys who come up in front of her for knife crime, for drugs, for country gangs, who don't, county gangs, who don't have a father, who don't have a, a figure, don't have, a, have any, any sort of role, figure, or father in their lives, they're costing the state. They're costing the state a huge amount of money. It costs over, if it costs, what, £45,000 to send a boy to Eton, it actually costs more than that to send it to Wandsworth Prison. And yeah. just, you know, probably similar experience for some people, I should imagine. But you know, the reality, reality is the state is involved because the state has to actually pick up the pieces from that dystopic, broken society. Therefore, you cannot stand back and say, it's not me, Gov, it's nothing to do with me, because it is something to do with you which is why i th i think your your question is the most pertinent and most important one that should be painted on signboards up and down the country what do we do to make to, to improve the situation firstly obviously examples you know that we've got to have examples secondly maybe fiscal mechanisms might actually work and, and thirdly people like you people like calvin People actually say, here I am, if I can, I mean, I, I'm not often quoting Martin Luther for fairly obvious reasons, but yeah, you know, here, here I stand, I can do no other. It, it's a perfectly valid position to take. I, I think that you've actually answered your own question earlier on, because what you've done, and this is the only conversation I've had with anybody, which has actually made this point as strongly and as vividly as you have, you've turned to empirical data and empirical evidence. You've not actually wrapped this in, in some sort of misty theological wish list. You've actually said, Look at the facts, look at the figures, look at the data. And as far as I'm concerned, that is what we should be doing at every opportunity. Not making the case and saying, you know, a, a, a church wedding is, is better than a register office wedding, but, but simply say marriage. And, you know, let, let's not actually get tied up with, with, with the, um, the mechanism of it. It's just actually the concept and the existence and the permanence and the stability of marriage. And that's where it's the empirical data that counts. Um, well, I completely agree, actually, that, that there are some positive uh, moves going on. And it is amazing that this particular issue has reached right to the top of politics. Um, and I would say I haven't done it on my own, though, because I've I've had, well, some cash support from from people who funded uh, the court cases I took, which is fantastic. And then lots of sort of ideas and moral support from from people who have kind of uh, other parents mainly who, who are interested in this subject. Um, but yeah, it is possible for a person to stand up as a citizen to do something for no other purpose other than that they're a citizen with concerns about something. And I think that is lacking. Uh, we are used to lobby groups and we're used to charities saying things about our civic uh, arrangements, uh, but we're not really used to just individuals doing so because it's very, very difficult. It's it's difficult to do that in a, a climate where the discussions can be quite heated and it's also just expensive and on time. And, and uh, uh, so, uh, yeah, but it can be done and it's actually um, I'm heartened by the fact that I have been listened to um, as just one person. So that's that's brilliant. I think there should be some very strong restrictions. I think RSE um, is, uh, you know, it's an incredibly potent subject. And it's I think people tend to act as if it's just something that we talk about to kind of have a nice, modern, healthy society with kids that are well informed and protect themselves in their relationships. And that's all it is. Well, it isn't that because, you know, as I say, the way men, women and children and families are constructed and the way the society is built yeah. around those ideas yeah. is absolutely yeah. fundamental to civilization and it's fundamental to peace. It's fundamental to the way we, you know, kind of keep children safe um, and to mess around with that in large ideological changes and also to open it up so that all children are in a position of being having delivered the same ideas centrally from you know one big edutech company or from uh, you know a, a particular um charity that has reached all the schools at once let's say when you open up that particular kind of teaching this is what actually totalitarian regimes do they try to control this the singular understanding amongst the youth um of these these very powerful ideas uh, that are political so i i think that really any wise government would be closing down that aperture, would be making the RSE curriculum very tight, very minimal, um, have it agreed around a table at, um, you know, that in, includes all the major stakeholders and voices, and then get it really locked down quite tight. Uh, and 
in, in all other regards, we have a very liberal education system and that's brilliant. But this is one place I don't feel you can be entirely liberal in your uh, education and leave it all up to the schools. And, and there's a really good reason for that, which is that sexuality is one of the parts of a person which is, you know, hard to control, hard to understand. And people go through their whole life perfecting this part of themselves or getting it wrong and struggling with it in terms of um in, in terms of doing right and wrong by each other and you know if that if if you ask teachers to all teach according to their own values on this you will just get an absolute mess on the ground which is i think what's happened it, so, it's, it's exactly what's happened yeah so we need to we need to somehow tighten that back to so there will i think there should be some kind of restrictions certainly age restrictions um uh, but we'll, we'll see how far the government goes they are reviewing it there is a review going on of RSE and there will be some improvements I'm told you know we we had a status quo when we were younger with a very tiny RSE curriculum maybe it was too small maybe there are things that need to be talked about in this generation that weren't in our generation I can perfectly well understand that but what that means is is that our generation just take for granted that there's a bit of sex ed in school and we don't you know we, it will be roughly what we thought and it'll be roughly reasonable and I think I, I really can't impress enough that for some schools, that's absolutely true. A well-run school with a sensible head is going to have a good policy and it comes out roughly right. And, and there are plenty of schools that do that. But where there are ideological um, pressures from lobby groups, there has been a huge amount of money involved in this. There are foreign influences. There are big international companies. There are, there are um, the NGOs and the UN all have ideas about the way that our culture should be in this area. Um, and they are really having rocking the British sense uh, in their schools a great deal. So parents should definitely go and ask to see it, make your views known when you do see it, um, and talk to other parents, like open the dialogue up. Uh, we, we shouldn't be worried about, you know, questioning these things um, and, yeah, speaking openly. Claire, one person can make a difference. You are a force of nature. Thank you very much for your time.